Welcome to the 11th annual George Washington Book Prize celebration. I'm Sheila Bear. It's a pleasure to join all of you in honoring Nick Bunker, the winner of the 2015 prize for his book, An Empire on the Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America. The George Washington Book Prize was established in 2005 at Washington College's C.V. Star Center for the Study of the American Experience in partnership with George Washington's Mount Vernon and the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. The $50,000 prize, named in honor of this college's founding patron, is one of the largest literary prizes in the nation. Awarded annually for the year's best book about America's founding era, it particularly recognizes well-written books that contribute to a broad public understanding of the American past and that often resonate with the issues and challenges of the present day. Nick Bunker's book is exemplary in both respects. An Empire on the Edge is history at its most vivid. And it also shows us that global financial crises and their political consequences are nothing very new. The American Revolution, as Mr. Bunker describes it, began not on one battlefield at Lexington, but in boardrooms, counting houses, and government offices scattered across thousands of miles. The same types of financial overreaching and political evasion that have caused certain problems in more recent times, as you may or may not recall, I certainly recall, <laughs> also split apart the British Empire and led to our country's independence. So something good did come out of it, something very good. Mr. Bunker's book was chosen from among dozens of nominees submitted to the Star Center and evaluated by a panel of distinguished scholars in the field, with the final decision made by a committee of judges from each of the three co-sponsors. The prize was officially awarded to him last May at a gala dinner at Mount Vernon, and we're delighted that he's now traveled back, thank you, across the water, a very far away from his home in Lincoln, England, to join us for this celebrate, celebration in Chestertown. In addition to Mr. Bunker's literary successes, he has also been an accomplished financial journalist and investment banker. And since he arrived on campus yesterday morning, he has visited classes and met with students and faculty in fields ranging from history to entrepreneurship and economics. We thank him for so generously sharing his expertise, mentorship, and good company. I would like, now like to call on stage Adam Goodhart, our Hodson Trust Griswold Director of the Star Center, who will introduce Mr. Bunker. Thank you. Nick Bunker will speak to us for 15 minutes or so, and then I'll rejoin him here on stage for a conversation not just about his prize-winning book, Empire on the Edge, but also about his work as a writer and scholar and some of the resonances between the 18th century stories he tells and the present day. We won't be taking questions from the audience at this event, but Mr. Bunker will be available for a book signing and at a reception right afterwards following the, in the lobby. I should also mention that copies of Mr. Bunker's book will be available at half price to Washington College students or anyone masquerading convincingly as a Washington College student. <laughs> Members of the board, that does not include you, sorry. Uh, right after the event, that's true at all of our Star Center events this year. Nick Bunker was educated at King's College, Cambridge, and at Columbia University, worked afterward as an investigative journalist and financial reporter, and then switched from newspapers to investment banking in the mid-1990s, which um, that fact alone, if you ask me, demonstrates his acute historical uh, consciousness. Um, he worked chiefly at the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, traveling extensively through many parts of the world. And his success in that field enabled him to launch a third career some years ago as a full-time historian. His successful first book was Making Haste from Babylon, The Mayflower Pilgrims and Their World, and that was followed last year by Empire on the Edge, How Britain Came to Fight America, which the BBC called utterly absorbing and full of color, and the Times of London called enthralling, and the US reviews, I can tell you, were not half bad either. In fact, not only did Empire on the Edge win the George Washington Book Prize, it was also chosen as a finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Prize in History. 
Nick, as Sheila said, has traveled to be with us today from Lincoln, England, where he and his wife live in a house built in the 12th century. So take that, you Chestertown colonists. <laughs> in any event, we are honored to welcome him to Washington College. Please join me in honoring Nick Bunker. Well, thank you, Adam, for those uh, very flattering remarks. And of course, I'd also like to thank uh, President Baer. I mean, I have to say that uh, I never expected uh, that I would ever find myself being preceded to a speaker's podium by a, a former chairman of the FDIC, uh, and certainly not by one as eloquent and as elegant as uh, Sheila Baer. Now, this is my first time uh, in at Wellington, Washington College, uh, my first time in Chestertown, and indeed my first time on the, uh, on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, it's only 36 hours since I had the, uh, the great pleasure of uh, driving across the, the Bay Bridge uh, in the early morning with the uh, sunshine gleaming, gleaming on the waters of Chesapeake Bay. And then I found myself uh, in, in what I think is the Kent, Island, Kent County equivalent of gridlock, which is that uh, I came into the highway, uh, on the highway into Chestertown, uh, in a kind of convoy uh, comprising my rental car, uh, a John Deere tractor, a horse box, and a truck bearing the legend Canine Country Club of Kent County. <laughs> Apparently these are the, the many facets of life in this particular part of the world. Now, as Sheena and Adam was saying, in the last couple of days, I've been uh, having quite a hectic schedule here uh, on the campus, on this magnificent campus, I have to say, uh, meeting uh, students and faculty and, and trustees and visitors. I've made many human friends, uh, but I, there has been one regret, one regret, uh, one disappointment, I have to say, which is that uh, I have not yet made the acquaintance of Gus the Goose, <laughs> uh, better known as Augustus, uh, Augustus the Goose. And I made some inquiries as, as to the whereabouts of, of Gus the Goose. I was speaking to Jay Griswold about this last night. And I understand that the situation is this, that the Gus cannot be with us because he's currently secluded um, in, with his campaign team in a rural retreat somewhere in uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania, to the north. And apparently the reason is that it's election time in Philadelphia in November, and Gus has decided to run as a write-in candidate for mayor of Philadelphia. Uh, well, the point is, you see, uh, because he's a descendant of George Washington, he is, he's an astute strategic thinker. And he's reached the conclusion that, that uh, a goose has more chance of, of winning the mayoralty of Philadelphia than a Republican. <laughs> so now, to the serious business of the evening. Um, I'm going to speak briefly, uh, as Adam said, about my book, An Empire on the Edge. And now, it's a multifaceted book. It covers a lot of territory, as he was suggesting, and as President Baer was suggesting, uh, from the Mississippi Valley way out to the east to the uh, Chinese seaport of Canton, which is where the East India Company acquired the tea that ended up dumped in Boston Harbor on the evening of December the 16th, 1773. Also covers a lot of different characters, a lot of personalities, a lot of politics, and a lot of different issues in, the, in the Britain and America of the time. So I had a lot of choice when it came to the matter of deciding what aspect of the book I could focus on briefly now. And I decided, therefore, to concentrate on the economic aspects of the book, not least because I knew that last night we were going to have the, the great enjoyment of, of listening to the fascinating symposium between uh, Mr. Secretary Paulson, former Treasury Secretary, and, of course, President Baer about their period during the financial crisis of 2008 to 9. So what I thought I'd do is just briefly to talk about the economic and financial aspects of an empire on the edge, and in particular about the role played uh, in the book by the founder of modern economic theory, that is to say, Adam Smith. Again, I thought that had kind of a connection with, with President Baer because, of course, Adam Smith fundamentally was a champion of the consumer, and, of course, that's what Sheila Baer was there to do as chairman of the FDIC. I'd just like to begin briefly by talking about a historical coincidence, the connection between the American Revolution on the one hand and the British Industrial Revolution on the other. In 1774, as you know, when the news arrived in London of the destruction of the tea in the Tea Party, the British government very swiftly put together a package of legislative measures to go through Parliament which are known as either the Coercive Acts or the Intolerable Acts, depending on which side of the pond you happen to be. The intention of these acts being to prevent the recurrence of anything of the same kind. 
and also to punish the Port of Boston. So they closed the Port of Boston and they produced these Acts of Parliament which effectively imposed direct rule from London and did away with the kind of democratic institutions that Massachusetts had enjoyed for the previous century or so. But there was something else going on in the British Parliament in 1774, which you won't have heard of, but which is actually very important from a British industrial point of view. And that was something called the Calico Act. Now, the Calico Act involved some of the same cast of characters. The situation was this. In addition to having a monopoly on the importation of tea from China, the East India Company also enjoyed a monopoly on the importation of silk and other textile fabrics from both China and from Bengal. Now, in the 1720s, in an attempt to ensure that its monopoly was protected, the East India Company had gone to the British government and tried to ensure that no British domestic manufactured fabrics could compete with the stuff that it brought back from the East. They got together with the manufacturers of woolens in England, and they persuaded the British government to enact a prohibitive duty, a double excise duty, on any cottons made by cotton spinners in England itself. Effectively, therefore, until the 1770s, it was impossible to spin any cotton in England and make a profit out of it. And then a hero emerged, uh, one of the great unsung heroes of British history, a man called Richard Arkwright. Arkwright was a, an engineer. He began his life actually as a barber and as a wig maker, but he also became a mechanic and an engineer. And in, late, in 1769, he applied for a patent for a new cotton spinning machine, Arkwright's spinning machine, powered by water, by water mills, by turbines driven by water. A potentially revolutionary machine because it could produce cotton far more cheaply and far more swiftly than ever before. Now, of course, he was going to face resistance from the monopolists, the East India Company, the woolen manufacturers, and so on. In 1774, therefore, he went to friends in Parliament, members of Parliament from the Midlands, which is where he was based. And in particular, he went to the Howe brothers. Now, the Howe brothers are famous, of course, because the Howe brothers were Army and Navy officers. One Howe was Admiral Howe, who became the Commander-in-Chief of the British Navy in America in 1775 to 1778. And the other one was his brother, General Howe, who was Commander of the Army in America at the same time. And they helped Richard Arkwright to put through Parliament an act which abolished the old restrictive double excise duty on domestic cotton. That was achieved at exactly the same time as the coercive and intolerable acts against Massachusetts. The impact was enormous. Within 10 years, Arkwright and his friends and colleagues had created a domestic industrialized manufacturing base producing cheap cotton fabrics which could be bought by the laboring classes of England. Production soared. By the middle of the 1780s, they were producing three million yards of cotton a year. This was tremendously important for British history. If you fast forward to the end of the 19th century, to the eve of World War I, the three greatest industries in Great Britain in terms of employment were the railways, deep mining of coal, and cotton textiles in Lancashire and Yorkshire. Tremendously important for Britain. It left a permanent mark on the nation. All happening at the same time, of course, as the American revolutionary process. Now, what's the connection? To get to the connection, we go to the work of Adam Smith. Because Adam Smith, in his great work, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, provided the clearest eyed and the most perceptive analysis of what was going on in Britain at the time. In particular, in part four, chapter seven, which deals with colonies and the reason why the British had a colonial system and the reason why the revolution broke out. And what Adam Smith pointed out was this, that the colonial system, the system that existed in the colonies, was simply the extension overseas of all the old monopolistic practices and restrictive practices and unfair tariffs and all kinds of other restrictions on free enterprise, which had been embodied in the double excise duty that was designed to protect the East India Company and the woolen manufacturers. The empire was simply the extension of that overseas into mainland America, into the British West Indies, and, of course, into the East India Company's new dominions in Bengal. The problem was that for the future, what the British really needed to do was they needed to break through to a new industrial model of the kind that Arkwright had introduced. That is to say, one based on the application of science and technology and the production of goods that the mass of people could afford rather than the few. 
Now, it took a long time before that occurred. It wasn't until the mid-Victorian period, the great years of mid-Victorian prosperity between the 1850s and the 1870s, that Britain actually got close to the kind of model that Arkwright and Adam Smith would have liked to see. In the meantime, what did they do? Well, they were a country, frankly, trying to live beyond their means to some extent. It was a commercial country, a nation of shopkeepers, but not yet really an industrial company, an industrial country. They couldn't yet really afford to spread prosperity among the masses because the sustainable rate of growth of the economy was simply too slow. So instead what they did was, well, they borrowed money. That's what you do when you can't quite afford to finance the lifestyle you wish. They borrowed money. They speculated. And this was what was going on in the 1760s and the 17th centuries. Lots of borrowing, lots of speculation. All ended in tears, of course. The banking crisis of 1772, which helped to cause the problems of the East India Company, which in turn led on to the exploitation of the tea to America and to the Tea Party. What they also did, of course, was to cling to the old empire because it seemed easier to make money by clinging to the empire and the, the artificial prosperity that it created rather than trying to, as I say, break through to the kind of industrial model that Arkwright and Adam Smith wanted to see. It was a very sad situation in many ways. But it should always be remembered, and this is where I'll come to my conclusion, that the real victims of the old empire, as it existed up until the American Revolutionary War, were not really the Americans themselves from an economic point of view. The American colonists were actually doing quite well. They were doing quite well because their trade with the East Indies was thriving, because immigrants, immigrants were arriving from Europe and from Britain, and they were adding to the dynamics in the American economy, and also because farmers like George Washington were finding an outlet for their wheat and so on in the hungry markets of the Mediterranean, for example. So the Americans actually weren't doing too badly economically. The people who were really suffering, actually, from the old imperial system were, first of all, of course, the slave populations. The slave populations, not only in mainland America, but also, of course, in the British West Indies and the French West Indies and the Spanish and Portuguese possessions, too. But the other group of people who were really suffering and who really needed a revolution were the people who never had one. That is to say, the laboring classes in Great Britain. What Adam Smith pointed out was this. In the system of laws which have been established for the management of our American and West Indian colonies, it is the interest of the home consumer that has been sacrificed. The point being that the empire was constructed in such a way that it artificially increased the price of all the goods which Britain brought back from the colonies. It had the effect of disadvantaging the ordinary laboring people of England. Americans complained because they were being asked in 1773 to pay a threepenny duty on each pound of tea. At the very same time, if you were a laboring man in England, you were asked to pay a duty eight times larger, a duty of two shillings. So I'll leave you with this thought. The Boston Tea Party was an event of great significance, but it shouldn't really have happened in Boston at all. It shouldn't have happened in Boston Harbor. The Tea Party, the destruction of the East India Company's tea, should really have happened in the Clyde, or the Thames, or the Mersey. It shouldn't have been a Boston Tea Party. It should have been a Tea Party involving the laborers of London or of Liverpool. It should really have been a Liverpool Tea Party. And that's where I'd like to leave you before we go into our conversation. Just suffice it to say, I would like to reiterate my thanks uh, for the George Washington Prize, this extremely generous prize. I'd like to reiterate the thanks that I, uh, that I say gave at uh, Mount Vernon to the Guild Lehrman Institute, uh, to the Mount Vernon, George, Mount Vernon, uh, to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, and also, of course, to the CV Star Center uh, and to Washington College and to Adam Goodhart. So, Nick, you know, one of the wonderful things that uh, you do in this book is you give us a sort of a, a, an immersion in the world of the 18th century. And in some ways, um, you make the 18th century a, a very, very attractive place to, to visit. Um, you really bring out, uh, of course, there's the, there's the squalor of the London poor, there's the um, oppression, um, although you might debate that, of the American colonists. Um, there are the sort of pudgy-fingered aristocrats over in, over in London um, making some, some foolish mistakes. But there's also there's the, there's the, there's the wit, there's the culture, there's the, there's the glamour. And um, 
I wanted to ask you, you enjoy living in the 18th century, um, don't you, in, your, in, in, in working, on, uh, working on books like this? We were talking at lunch about how you're an 18th century. I do. I do. In soul. fact, there's one thing you haven't mentioned, which is the music, and the music. Uh, which is just how musical a place London was at the time. Uh, America less so, of course, but I mean, this was the London that was visited by uh, C.P. Bach and J.S. Bach and by Haydn and so on, and a bit later on by Mozart, a bit beyond this period. It was a very musical place, and in fact, one of the things I did while I was uh, writing the book was that I often was playing Haydn symphonies while I was writing the book, mm. uh, those which were actually written precisely in 1773, 1774, 1775. So you're absolutely right, yes. I mean, you know, clearly, I mean, life expectancy was, 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 was much lower in the 18th century. Um, there are all kinds of reasons why, you know, standards of dentistry being what one were, one wouldn't want to wish live in 18th century London. but but. There was an excellent book uh, written a number of years ago by a British scholar, which I think sums this up. He, he wrote a book about London called City of Laughter, mm. about just how exuberant and enjoyable a place London was. And I think that is something that's worth remembering. Yeah. There was a wonderful sort of ribald sense of humor that, that vanished um, in public, at least, by the 19th century, right? There's that great cartoon that you have of the American um, political leaders sitting on, on the toilet together. So it's, right. I mean, really racy stuff. That, that's, that's absolutely right. That, that is an important cultural phenomenon in Britain, which was that it was partly due to the influence of evangelical Christianity that, that there was a kind of general cleaning up of public discourse around about 1810, 1820, uh, so that the, the, the official discourse and, and the kind of polite discourse of the, of the 19th century was very different to the polite discourse of the 1770s and 1780s. You're making me want to live in the 18th century a little <laughs> bit instead of the 19th. Um, you also, uh, besides your, your portrait of, of the era and your, your portraits of people, of characters, which we can get to in a moment, um, you draw wonderful portraits of places. And actually, I, I'm teaching a, a seminar this semester, a freshman seminar that's about place and sense of place. And um, my students are here, many of them in the front row. Hello, students. Um, and uh, so I, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, you, you, you talk about not just obvious places like London and Boston, but you um, talk about Providence, Rhode Island. You write wonderfully about that. You write about Canton, China. Um, you write about what it was like to, to um, visit the buildings of the British Parliament in the 1770s, a wonderful picture of, of that. So, um, you, and you also, you actually start the book with an unexpected place, this crumbling fort on the Mississippi frontier in the early 1770s. So, can you tell us about why you like to write a sort of a history that immerses the reader in, in place like that? Well, I mean, there's a number of reasons, really. Uh, one thing I do, for example, is I don't just write about places, I write about buildings. You mm -hmm. know, I'm very interested in architectural history, partly because I love architecture, but also as a way of getting you into the culture of a period. I mean, the 18th century was a period when architecture was tremendously important to uh, people like John Hancock, people like Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and certainly to the, to the British elite too. I mean, they really valued uh, buildings and they were fascinated by what buildings represented. I, one thing I looked at, for example, was the books that John Hancock presented to Harvard College. And he presented to Harvard College books including uh, the complete works of Pladio and the complete works of Robert Adam, the British architect. Uh, so they were really fascinated by buildings. And I try to use buildings in my book in, in order to try and convey the kind of cultural attitudes and values of the period. So that's one thing. Also, in terms of question of place, well, you know, I don't really know any other way to write, frankly. Mm. I mean, um, it's like cinema. You know, I, I don't really know any other way to tell a story than by putting it in its visual setting. So to me, it just seems perfectly natural. And finally, there's another point here, which is that um, in the 18th century, of course, the dominant form of wealth was landed property. You know, the British are still obsessed with real estate, uh, but they were even more obsessed with it in the 18th century. And it's terribly important to remember that, that Britain had what you might call a territorial constitution in which landowners were the people who had the vote and landowners were the people who, who ended up in Parliament and the rights and privileges of the ownership of land were tremendously important. And that's kind of a third reason why it's so important to get at uh, the places from which people came. You've got this um, varied career that uh, we, we heard a little bit about earlier, and um, I think it's, it's clearly informed your, your writing. Um, one of the things that wasn't mentioned in the introduction is that you were the chairman of the board at the Freud Museum in London and, and involved there in, in different ways for, for a number of years. And um, I wonder if you could talk about, uh, you have these psychological portraits in the book that are very acute. So I wonder if you could talk about um, your interest in psychology and in, in character. 
Well, my interest in psychoanalysis, Freudian psychoanalysis, went back to when I was at Cambridge University because then it, it was very fashionable uh, intellectually. Um, and uh, I read a great deal of Freud's work while I was at Cambridge. Um, and it stuck with me. And uh, I did indeed become involved with the Freud Museum. I was uh, a member of the board, and then eventually I was chairman. Um, I wouldn't call myself a Freudian. I don't attempt to psychoanalyze the characters. But obviously, I do, I do take a, a close, I, I think it's terribly important to, to write subtle character studies. And yes, I would read Freud's case histories uh, as, as an example of extremely subtle and perceptive of case studies of character. I wouldn't necessarily describe the theoretical mm -hmm. work of Freud, but I think they're terribly important as a model. And I'm not the only person who did this. One of my great heroes as a historian was the British historian Sir Louis Namier, uh, who's kind of unfashionable now, but I think needs to be rediscovered. Uh, he was a British historian in the, in the 1920s and 30s who kind of revolutionized the study of the 18th century. Um, he wasn't actually British at all. He was actually a Polish Jew, uh, but he'd come to live in Britain and fall in love with it. But in addition to that, of course, he was fascinated by the work of Freud. And, and he took a Freudian view was that, that human beings, including politicians, are, are motivated by basic instincts, kind of drives for dominion in particular. And he saw politics as a kind of theater in which people were trying to work out all these drives for dominion. Mm -hmm. And that's how he wrote about the 18th century parliament. And, and I sort of take a similar view, yes. Um, and one great thing about taking this kind of interest in Freudian psychoanalysis is it stops you being judgmental. Mm. That's really, really important. It stops you being judgmental about the characters and also trying to fit them too neatly into ideological categories. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important uh, in any kind of history, but particularly this one. So you're not saying that if George III had had a healthier relationship with his mother, we'd still be a colony here in Maryland? No, I don't think so. I mean, okay. unfortunately, of course, the madness of King George III, you know, thanks to John Bennett's great play, has become kind of the dominant image of mm -hmm. George III which is a bit unfortunate because, of course, George III did not show his first signs of madness until, I think, 1786 or 7, which was, was long after the war was over. It is rather unfortunate, actually. Now, having said that, there are aspects of George III's character which did influence the war, not madness, but other things. Now, one thing about George III was that he was somebody who had a very painful sense of duty. He was also very, very punctual. He was a stickler for doing everything according to the book. Mm. Uh, he had all those kinds of characteristics. And indeed, Namia did actually believe that some of those derived from certain aspects of relationship with his mother. Mm. Now, they didn't cause the revolution, but they certainly didn't necessarily help mm. in 1774. That inflexibility. Uh, yeah, stick, I mean, yeah. That, that tendency to, to want to have everything done according to the rules. Mm. And also, once you would decided on a course of action, having to stick to it. Mm. Because that painful sense of duty meant that once they'd set off down a particular path, George the is going to say, we've got to keep on to the end of the road, mm. because that's our duty. And that isn't necessarily terribly helpful. Yeah, early in the book, you, you described your project as a sympathetic study of failure, <laughs> um, which I thought was kind of a, a remarkable phrase. And could you talk about that? Because I think there is sympathy here, but at the same time, you, you sort of, a reader just smacks his head and says, what were these guys thinking? Um, it just, it seems like they, they fumbled so many opportunities. Well, yes, they did. And I mean, I, one has to try and explain why that occurred. Now, of course, there were lots of aspects of, 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 the, um, of what was going on on the American side, which one can criticize as well. Uh, you need to bear that in mind. I mean, particularly, I think that Americans, I, American historians, I think, tend to obscure or to conceal the extent to which Americans willingly and enthusiastically, in some places, enter into an armed struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that American historians tend to have a bit of a, a blind spot about. Um, but yeah, it's Sympathetic Study of Failure, that's right. I actually got that title, actually, from a book about Winston Churchill. Uh, oh, really? There was a British historian, Robert Rhodes James, who many years ago wrote a book about Churchill called Churchill, A Study in Failure. Mm. It dealt with Churchill's life before 1939. Mm. And the point he was making was, of course, that if the Second World War had not broken out, or if Churchill had, say, died of a heart attack in 1939, mm. people would remember him of actually having been a failure. Mm. It's always important to remember that, that the difference between failure and success in politics can simply be a matter of timing. And, and there's so many wonderful moments in your book where you, you do have this sort of exquisite sense of accident and just narrowly missed opportunities and messages that were delivered at just slightly the wrong moment that led to all sorts of consequences. And, um, it, you know, you also talk about how political leaders deal with crises and, and solve problems, I think, um, in a way that's, that's very sensitive. And um, you talk, one thing, one thing you really, you, you give a sense of that, resonated for me with what Sheila Bear and Hank Paulson said yesterday, is that often in trying to solve one problem, 
leaders ignore or fumble or defer a bigger one? And do you think that was the case in the 1770s? Oh, yeah. I mean, one thing, for example, was the British were very, very concerned about something else which was going on, which was the rise of Russia and Prussia as military mm. powers, particularly Russia. Mm. I mean, the big event internationally, and actually this is a terribly important event in its own right of the early 1770s, was, was something else completely. It was the partition of Poland in 1772, which is when Russia, Prussia, and Austria-Hungary between them carved up the kingdom of Poland. And this was only the first of many kind of attacks upon the territorial integrity of Poland, you know, which, of course, which we're all aware of and, and just how terrible that history was. Uh, and that was something they were, the British were really fixated on because it really did seem, first of all, they were very upset and angry about what they thought was a blatant breach of international law, which it was. And they were also worried that there was going to be a general European conflict. And that was not unreasonable. That was a perfectly reasonable view to take. The difficulty was that, that in 73, 1774, uh, they ended up reaping the consequences of having become just too preoccupied with that and really not seeing that there was this other great uh, mm. threat that was emerging on the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, I, I guess every country sort of sees itself as the center of the universe, and uh, maybe Americans are more guilty of this <laughs> even than, than others are, um, maybe even in the 18th century. But, uh, you know, you, um, you really do... Uh, um, um, really show how, how little these British leaders were thinking about us, were, um, were aware of us to, some, to, some, to a surprising degree, I think, um, weren't visiting here. And for instance, um, you talk about how Lord Dartmouth, the foreign secretary, about a year into his administration, sent out a questionnaire to all of the royal governors of the American colonies. And the first question on this questionnaire was, where is your colony located? Well, it wasn't actually, actually, it wasn't just, quite well, where they didn't. It didn't actually literally say where is your colony. It okay. did, but it asked for, for exactly where their, their, their latitude and longitude and asked for I the boundaries see. and so on. Okay. And there was a perfectly good reason for that, which was that they were concerned about boundary disputes. Mm. The British okay. did not like to see the individual colonies quarreling about their boundaries, which right. they did. And this went on you know, after, long after the revolution began. Um, but yes, that is true. He sent out this questionnaire. The problem was you didn't get replies. Hmm. Uh, the, the questionnaires were sent out in, I think, the middle of uh, 1773. And some of the colonies never replied at all. Uh, some of the replies only arrived after the revolution had actually begun. Hmm. And it is true that the British, yes, were often lacking in up-to-date information. They had actually in the past, previously, back in the 1720s and 30s and 40s, they actually had better information. Hmm. At that time, the British were actually getting good reports from the colonies. And the colonies had agents in London, the colonial agents, who were passing on information. Mm. But a lot of that kind of thing had kind of fallen by the wayside. Mm. Um, and they had some of their oldest friends in America, uh, men like, for example, Cadwallader de Colden, who was the lieutenant governor of New York, who had been very helpful and very friendly, were now old men. And they were also uh, becoming less active in the material that, that they passed on. Now, you uh, worked as a journalist for a number of years. You were trained at Columbia School of Journalism. And I had the sense that that influenced your book maybe in, in, in several ways or influenced um, your approach to, to writing about history and thinking about history, certainly in your sense of the importance of the flow of information, um, the lack of information, the sort of um, unevenness with which information can be distributed at times. Um, are there other ways, too, um, that uh, your, your work as a journalist has, has informed your work as a historian? And, and what beats did you cover as a, as a journalist that may have helped inform this book? Well, I did actually spend a period as, as a parliamentary reporter in England, in London. And um, that's something that was, I, it was only for about a year or so, mm. um, mid-'80s. That's when I met Tony Blair, actually, strangely enough. I actually got to know Tony Blair reasonably well in about 1985-86. Mm. But, of course, I didn't have the, the, the perception at that time to realize that he was eventually going to become prime minister. Mm. Because at that time, we never thought there'd be another Labour government. We, right. thought, the, we thought the Tories would be in power forever. Sort of like where but we I are But I did now. actually get to know him quite well at the time. Um, and and you know, why that helps is that you get used to interacting with politicians. And that certainly helps with writing a book like this. Because um, one of the things you learn is that whatever you, one says about politicians, they do often have certain admirable qualities to them. Mm. Um, they're thick skin, for example. I mean, to, to get it anywhere serious in politics, you have to be very thick-skinned. You have to have this potential to, when you fall off the horse, get right back on one mm. again. And that's something which is, which is actually quite admirable about some politi many politicians, that ability to sort of keep coming back. And there are other things you learn. And, and frankly, I don't think I ever met anybody, and I knew met a lot of British politicians, I don't think I ever met any that I thought were um, morally culpable or, or <laughs> you know, 
I don't think so. I don't think I ever met a kind of real scoundrel in politics. I met a few scoundrels in other fields of life, but not, but not in politics, no. It, you're reminding me of um, a, a great uh, American biographer and political writer who lived um, in Chestertown until he passed away a few years ago, Richard Ben Kramer, who wrote biographies of politicians and also biographies of baseball players. And Richard used to say, you know, the public has it completely backwards. They think politicians are monsters and professional athletes are these sort of great, <laughs> yeah, solid yeah, guys. Yeah. He says the other way, the athletes are monsters. And most politicians actually do really want to do good in the world. Um, now, was that true of the politicians who were leading 18th century England? Were they, were they well-intentioned men? Were they selfish men? Of course, they were all men. Uh, yeah, well, they were. Um, I mean, there was Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, didn't come, in, come along for another 20 years or right. so. Um, well, I... I, mm, I I think Namia basically got it right. I mean, they, they were sort of acting out their kind of inner needs, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and um, uh, they certainly believed they were doing the right thing for the country. Uh, but a lot of the time, what they were doing was they were enjoying being performers, you see. I mean, there was a very strong element in England at the time of theatre. Politics and theatre kind of interacted mm. with each other. Now, the and theater, politicians and actresses quite often too. Yeah, well, right? possibly, possibly. Yeah. Um, but, but if they were lucky. But um, <laughs> the, 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 in England at the time, in London at the time, the, the most popular form of entertainment for the elite was the theatre. George III went to the theatre as often as he possibly could. Mm. Um, there was a roll box always. People loved going. So did Franklin, actually. I mean, Franklin was the first night of She Soups to Conquer, for example. Mm. And of course, George Washington loved the theatre too. It's, it just Boston was the place, of course, where you couldn't have a theatre. Um, uh, you know, it was illegal, um, which tells you quite a lot actually about the difference between England and America at the time. Mm. Now, so the theatre was terribly popular, and there were actors and playwrights who became politicians, there were politicians who wrote plays, and there was a strong element in the House of Commons of having to be a performer. You couldn't really be successful in the House of Commons and command the respect of both the king and your fellow members of parliament unless you could perform on your feet, unless you could be something of an entertainer, uh, and unless also you could, you could squash your opponents with, with repartee and so on. And, and this is one of the great strengths of Lord North, that that's exactly what he could do. Mm. He was very popular. Do you think that tradition endures at all in British politics today, mm. that, that sense of Well, I think they may think it does, but I, uh, <laughs> no, I think it's not that question. <laughs> uh, you know, you're, you're talking about the, the common interest that um, George III had with, with Washington and, and Franklin. Um, do you think that, that by this point, of course, the ancestors of Washington and Franklin had, had lived in America for about a century at that point. Do you think by this point, by the 1770s, um, the people in these two nations um, still had most things in common with each other? Or do you think that really culturally they had begun to diverge to significant extents that influenced the revolution? Well, I mean, this is, this is an issue about which American historians debate with each other at the yeah. moment. I mean, there is a thesis, the Anglicization thesis, that says that actually on the eve of the revolution, America was becoming much more Anglicized. Mm. And it was precisely become, because Britain was becoming much more Anglicized and was buying into British ideas about constitutionality and the need for representation, et cetera, that the revolution in a sense began because they felt that the British were letting them down, if you like. The, the Anglicization thesis is very important. And I haven't think, I'm a bit skeptical about that, quite frankly. I think the cultural divergences are more important. I mean, for example, you know, the fact that Boston didn't have a theater, mm. that's a big difference from London. The fact that Boston didn't have a bank you know, there are so many aspects of the, the thing was, you see, it wasn't so much that they were diverging uh, in a simple way. They were moving at different speeds. And, 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 and London in particular was developing very rapidly in ways that, that you couldn't possibly expect America to, 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 to catch up with. Because, you know, London was a city of nearly a million people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, very cosmopolitan as it still is now. And in places very, very wealthy too. Mm -hmm. So I think generally speaking, I would emphasize more the divergence. And, and now perhaps we're growing back uh, together again in, in some Well, yeah, so I think, I think that's true, yeah. actually. Yeah, certainly London and New York are growing back yeah. together again, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, now, uh, you've spent a good deal of time in the, in the States. You studied at Columbia um, in the 80s. I know you've traveled here a lot, even though you sadly haven't made it to the Eastern Shore before. Now we're glad you've remedied this. Um, but uh, have your travels in America and the time you've lived in America informed the way that you think about Americans and portray Americans in your, in your books? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's generally sympathetic, obviously. Um, uh, well, but there are so many things. But, but, but one thing that, that, that I think is terribly important is, is, is never to get too pessimistic about things. Mm. Uh, because, I mean, you know, you and I were talking about this earlier. I mean, um, 
there were some things that I saw in New York in the early 1980s when I lived there, um, which encouraged me not to feel pessimistic. You see, what I mean is this, that I was in New York from 1981 to 83. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you may have seen a film called The Most Violent Year or Most Violent Year about the fact that 1981 was the most violent year in New York's history. Well, that was when I was there. Mm -hmm. And in, in those days, you know, we, we really thought that it was going to be the end of the world was nigh, you know, when we had 1,800 murders a year in New York and, and the city was, was still feeling the impact of the fiscal crisis of 75. It was still trying to reconstruct itself from that. The subway was falling apart. The streets were full of holes. You know, it was, it was real urban dystopia. Hard to and, imagine now. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I did when I was at Columbia was that I, I, was gonna, I knew I was going to come back to Britain, and I knew I was going to uh, have to get a job as a journalist. And I knew that was going to be very hard, because the early 80s in Great Britain was a period of pretty um, severe economic recession. So I, I've really got to do something. I thought, you know, it would be quite special here. So what I did while I was at Columbia at the journalism school was that um, as one of my projects, it, we had a, a student-run magazine or newspaper which covered things in the South Bronx. So what I did was, you just pulled a Hank Paulson there. Yeah, I just pulled yeah. a Hank Paulson, yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. I mentioned the South Bronx, <laughs> everything falls apart. <laughs> but, right. but, but, but um, so what I did was, I thought I'm going to do something special here. So I, um, I went to see the, uh, through various people who were at the journalism school, I, I got in touch with the New York Police Department, and I asked permission to spend several months attaching myself to a police precinct in the South Bronx. And, and I selected the one concerned by going down to, to City Hall and looking at the statistical records and finding which precincts in New York had the highest crime rate. Hmm. And that was the 44th precinct, which, if anybody knows New York, is, is up near the George Washington Bridge okay. in the southwest Bronx. <laughs> and I spent several months there attaching myself to the, uh, to the police, wow. uh, to the police uh, and I would go out with them on patrol and all this sort of thing. And, this, and it was a pretty of a strange experience. As you can imagine, it was a bit odd for them to have this kind of this sort of skinny English youth attached. <laughs> and, and, but it was a very interesting experience for me. And, and, I, and I wrote various articles about this. And that's how I got a job in, in Liverpool, the Liverpool Echo, on the basis of having done that. Hmm. Um, because it was all pretty striking stuff. Because you can imagine, it was, uh, yeah, one certainly saw a slice of life um, hmm. in the South Bronx. You know, um, in the, it was the uh, late 82, early 1983. And speaking of, of moments of, of fiscal crisis, you really trace so much of the outbreak of the American Revolution to the crash of 1772. And there are so many echoes um, with, with recent, recent financial history with this sort of um, runaway speculation and these rogue actors and too much faith in derivatives and a sort of an, an unfortunate confluence of, of finance and politics and sometimes collusion between um, financial interests and, and politicians. And you were writing this book, of course, in, in the wake of um, a crash. In some ways, was quite different, of course, but in, in some ways uh, had similarities. Were you informed, do you think, by, by uh, the recent history? Actually, not so much, mm. uh, because I, I certainly thought it would something, I knew it was something that would strike a chord with readers. Um, but that wasn't really why I was writing about it. Mm. I mean, I was writing about it because I actually think, genuinely think that this, this was a very serious and very important issue. Um, and the crash of 1772 is one which has, has been touched. There are some authors who have dealt with it. I mean, for example, Tim Breen, uh, Professor Breen of, of, you know, of Northwestern University. I'm not sure where he is now. But he wrote a book called Tobacco Culture in which he dealt specifically with the, the way in which the tobacco planters of Virginia were affected by the banking crash of 1772. The one or two other people have written about it. But it isn't, it's, a, it's an episode that isn't really that well known, but I think definitely was important. So uh, even if there hadn't been a, a crash of 2008 to 9, I still would have been giving that a lot of emphasis. Can, can you tell us about uh, one of these rogue actors? You have some great portraits, maybe not quite a Bernie Madoff of the 18th century, but uh, some guys who, who come pretty close. Well, um, well, I had him in America too, of course. Uh, the uh, I, one character I'm actually disappointed I didn't write more about was Ethan Allen. Hmm. I actually wanted to write about Ethan Allen because I think Ethan Allen's role was actually more important. He wasn't a Madoff character, though. No, I just I just mentioned him because um, it's just that that that, that I, I did spend some time researching what was going on in Vermont because actually you can argue that the first violent act of the revolution actually occurred not in at Lexington but in. Um, uh, Westminster, Vermont, mm. which there was an incident in the courthouse there, actually. So, so but, that's, but I'm digressing when I talk about Ethan Allen. Um, in terms of the London characters, well, well, the, the principal the villain of the piece, shall we say, was a man called Sir George Colebrook. And Colebrook was the chairman of the East India Company. 
Um, he was, well, he wasn't a Bernie Madoff. Um, he was, uh, he was simply a, a, a very aggressive, adventurous speculator. He was a risk taker. And he was always up to, all, he had fingers in all kinds of pies. Um, he was investing in lead mines in Scotland, and he had a bank in Ireland, and he was a defense contractor, and he was this, and he was that. He was a commodity speculator. He tried to corner the world market in a thing called alum, aluminum sulfate, which is used in the textile business. Mm -hmm. And he tried to buy all the aluminum sulfate stocks in the world to drive the price up, and it was all a complete disaster. Um, so he was one. Uh, the problem with him is he's kind of a shadowy, he's a bit of a shadowy figure because, of course, he went bankrupt. And one of the sad things is that when people go bankrupt, their records and papers often just disappear because there's no one to keep them. So we don't know anything like as much as Sir George, about Sir George Colbrook as we would like to. Um, but he did do one thing, which is important for the book, which is that he wrote um, a really excellent memoir, a private memoir that was never published but kept for private circulation among his family. Um, and eventually it was printed privately in about 1890 of and in this book, what he does is he gives this really candid autobiographical account of his life as a financier, but also he gives a kind of an insider's account of the events that led to the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. He gives an insider's account of the decision-making inside the British government that led to the fatal decision to send the tea. Mm -hmm. And that's really useful, mm -hmm. and I certainly refer to that at some length. And, and, and on the basis of that account, which has been referred to by one or two historians, but not widely, because it's very hard to get hold of. I mean, there's only one microfilm of it that I know of in the UK at Cambridge, mm. and I don't know of any other copy in the UK. Um, and that was certainly very useful because it enabled me to reconstruct the decision-making process, mm. which is pretty convoluted. Um, but again, I don't think he was a villain, no. I mean, he was, you know, he was, he was, and people treated, he was more of a figure of fun, really, than anything else. You, you do have a, a wonderful gift for mining the sources and pulling out these, these gems and some just wonderful moments of sensory detail. And one of the things I always push my, my students as, as writers is get detail, get detail, get detail, get specific, um, find things that are, are sensory, that connect, can connect with the reader almost on a physical level. And there's one especially detail that I love, which is you actually you talk about the smell of tea in the 18th century, the smell and the taste of 18th century tea. And I wonder, uh, do you remember where you found that? And are these things that you tend to look, they're not easy to find. Are these details you tend to look for really hard or do they just sort of come up and you say, aha, this is something I have to put in my pocket? And, I think it's very important to get as much of that as you, because there's actually a lot of material on, on, on the East India Company tea trade because the East India Company kept their own very good records. Yeah. Also something else, which is that uh, at Cambridge uh, in England, there is a, a center for the study of Chinese culture. It was um, founded by, uh, well, it's named in honor of a guy called Joseph Needham. And Joseph Needham was a very important scholar uh, in Cambridge. He was a scientist, but also a sinologist. And that library that, that was created for him has a lot of really, really useful material in it, which is essentially Chinese material, which you can access, mm. um, and that helps. Mm. And Needham edited this great book called Science and Civilization in China in many volumes, which has some really excellent sections on tea, which I mm. used. But also, of course, it is actually possible to get hold of the tea. Mm. Uh, mm. There were various, the tea that was dumped in the harbor in Boston was mainly Bohea. Mm -hmm. Now, Bohea was a kind of mangled English version of the name of a range of mountains in China. Mm. And uh, that tea you can still get hold of. Uh, it's got a different name now, but you can get hold of it. Mm. Um, and you basically drink it, you know, see what it's like. And uh, similarly, there was a tea called Hyson, uh, which was the most expensive kind of tea that was available. And again, that can still be acquired. It still is a very expensive form of tea, but it's a delicious form of tea. I think it's Huang Jia, I think it is. Um, so, I, so I, you know, I actually tried drinking all these. I mean, I actually did a lot, drink a lot of green tea hmm. while I was in the process of writing the book. Hmm. So you're a, you're a tea fancier. And yes, well, you see, yes, as it happens in Lincoln, in one of the medieval buildings in Lincoln, we actually had this superb uh, tea company called the Imperial Tea Company who hmm. shipped tea all over the place, and I popped down there and buy the tea there. Walking around Chestertown, of course, we were an imperial outpost as well. Um, do you find any resonance here in this town with the story that you tell. Well, you've got some lovely buildings. I mean, the Custom House itself is a lovely building. Um, and that's a, that's a superb building. And yes, I think that's right. And, and of course, also it's interesting, of course, is the grid pattern too. Um, that it's, it's not unlike Providence. Mm. Uh, this looks a bit like the way Providence would have looked. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm particularly keen on Providence, Rhode Island, because that's the place where you can really get a sense of, of, of the way a New England town at the time really looked. Boston, of course, the trouble with Boston is that the big fires of the 19th century that mm -hmm. swept away the waterfront, 
and the huge amount of draining and land reclamation that went on the draining of Back Bay, and then the kind of willful destruction of so much of the built heritage of Boston when they built South Station, yeah. and that, those you know, terrible kind of um, uh, urban motorways they have in, mm -hmm. in, in Boston, which just wrecked everything, basically, so that incredibly difficult to, to visualize anything in Boston now, really. Providence, uh, uh, the bit around Brown University is much yeah, easier. wonderful, Jim. Well, I have maybe as a last question um, for you, this was a question that I was um, restraining myself with difficulty from, from following up on when we had lunch just now. Um, you mentioned that among your um, political ideas, um, you believe in the re-legalization of dueling. Uh, I wonder if you would like to defend that view. <laughs> no, not, not seriously. It's just okay, that, well, give us your... No, well, no, what it is is this, that, you know, we're now living in this culture where, you know, people feel free on the internet to say the most terrible things about other people. You know, we have this kind of culture of, of, of defamation and slander and people hurling insults to each other and sounding off far too easily. And, uh, and you know, public figures receive all kinds of abusive emails and so on, and people abuse each other on Facebook and all the rest of it. And I think the legalization of dueling would, would, would encourage people to be a bit more kind of uh, moderate and civilized in the language they use. Mm. You know, if they face the prospect of being called out you know, for an exchange of, of pistols at dawn on, high, on, you know, on Bagshot Heath in London yeah. on Hyde Park, they might actually be a bit more restrained in their language. You know, that's, that's all I have in mind. I mean, I'm not, I'm not advocating, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know it, would be, it, would be, it would be picturesque. Okay, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking like, you know, Donald Trump and Megyn Kelly, 10 paces at dawn and from the Trump Plaza, right? That's a, well, it would certainly sort out who was serious and who wasn't, wouldn't it? And I mean, it, you know, I mean, I mean, it, you know, and obviously, you know, dueling was, after all, commonplace among some of the early heroes of the American Republic. I mean, Alexander Hamilton being one example, but 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 I think Andrew Jackson, of course, if I remember right. Although with him, it wasn't so much dueling. I think it was actually kind of bare fist fighting on the various occasions. Yeah. But um, yeah. I'm not seriously advocating this. You know, uh, okay. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for going mano a mano with me here. Thank you for visiting Washington College, and again, congratulations on the Washington Prize. <laughs>